My dear brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah Khair for the uh, invitation, for the introduction. I'll try to make it as short and sweet as possible. And if we have some questions after, inshallah, uh, we'll address those. Uh, basically, I don't want this lecture to be just an inspirational lecture. I know we're all very happy when we see reverts. Actually, the most searched uh, topic on Google by Muslims and non-Muslims, believe it or not, when it comes to Islam is uh, the word conversion or reversion or, you know, my story to Islam. People are very interested in that. Because it um, gives you like a, an Iman rush, you know, when you hear someone, you're like, SubhanAllah, with all the things that they say about us in the media, you still see so many people coming to Islam, right? And you're just like, SubhanAllah, you're so motivated, you're so inspired by these stories. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these stories on YouTube and you look at them and your families and whenever you see them on Instagram or on Facebook, you get just really inspired. Or when you see a new Muslim, you go to like, brother, please tell me your, your sister uh, or sister, please tell me your story. Brother, please tell me your story. That's very amazing. Wow. And you get very inspired, isn't it? But my purpose tonight is to go beyond that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to relate my story to uh, some action points and that is how to get the community to be involved more with new Muslims and when I say community I don't mean the masjid problem is that we come mashallah to the masjid there's so many facilities here I love the center mashallah and then we expect the same five to ten people to do the work while we take advantage of these facilities we come pray but we don't contribute sometimes and we need to go beyond that we need to go beyond just sometimes just giving some support financially and so on. We need to get involved. Because yes, money is important, no doubt. You can't do anything without money. I mean, you wouldn't have this place without money. But what's even more important is the support. Uh, for a new Muslim, like myself, I'm not a new Muslim, I'm a very old Muslim. But uh, for new Muslims, and I'm talking about the first year into Islam, the second year into Islam, the third year into Islam, the fourth year into Islam, even the fifth year, the first five years are the most difficult years because that's where the identity somehow gets revamped, it changes a bit, you start adapting some of the cultural uh, Islamic practices and you do change, there's an adjustment and that comes with a, an impact. Um, in psychology we call it, you know, uh, schemas or the way you understand life and you adapt those into your life schema that you had before and you have to make some changes to yourself in order to be able to properly embrace Islam and it's not good enough to just say Shahada and I'm sure you've had Shahadas in this place quite a lot everyone gets very happy Takbir, Allahu Akbar people line up, they give you a hug they tell you halal chicken is across the street and you know, Ma'as-Salam it's not like that. Uh, it takes more than that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, tells us, Ya ladina amanu, udkhulu fi silmi kafah. When you enter Islam, you should enter it fully. It shouldn't be just, okay, I became Muslim. I'll come pray once in a while. Um, I'll eat halal chicken and uh, that's it. No, I changed my name to, from Mike to Muhammad. It's not enough. We want our new Muslims to be part of our community. We want our new Muslims to contribute to this community, not to be just another person. MashaAllah, that's good that they become Muslim. MashaAllah, Allah will give them Jannah. But we want them to be active members of our community because all of them have something to contribute to this community. They have skills that they can offer to the community and the community needs these skills. And because of where you live, they can contribute to society sometimes better than you can. Now, I'm living in the Arab world, so I'm not, I love Arabs. You know, I love them. And they're my brothers, and I learned so much from them. And all my teachers are Arabs. But in Australia or Canada, or, you know, they're the ones who have set up the centers. They're the ones who have put together, you know, these organizations. But sometimes you need the locals to reach to the locals. And that's a strategy. And you need to bring them on board and know that how you can use their skills and their abilities to spread the message of Islam. 
I mean, if that's not our intention to give humanity the light of Islam, then what is it? Why are we here for? How do we justify, forget about living in a non-Muslim country or something like that. That's a different debate. How do we justify existing? How do we justify breathing and being Muslims? How do we justify taking all the ni'mah, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting all these blessings, but yet not doing anything for it? And not sharing it with others. I mean, we're sitting on a huge treasure. And that's my first point. We need, as Muslims, our Muslim community, and the new Muslims, to think and know and understand and internalize that Islam is not just a religion amongst us, other religions. These new Muslims have not just done some religion hopping, you know, let me check this one and this one and this one. Oh, here's Islam as well. No. Islam is the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna deena in Allah al-Islam. With Allah, the path, not the religion, the way is Islam. And when we internalize that and we believe it, it's not just something that has been given to us. It's not just something like, wow, I really like Muslims. You know, they have cool beards, nice tobes. I'm going to just join their, you know, their club. No, it's not like that. It's like, I know, I believe that this is the path to Jannah. And I want to get there. And not just that, I want to share it with the rest of the world. And the Prophet Sallallahu he was, of course, Rasulullah. But he was a person who served humanity and spent his whole life trying to save people from hellfire. And we know the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu when he's talking, he's comparing us to the little flies that are flying around, being attracted to the, to the light, to the fire. And he's trying to stop us. He's trying to stop the people from going there. He didn't say, oh, you're like this and you're like this. No, he's trying to stop the people from going towards hellfire. And that was the Prophet ﷺ. He did his best to make sure that we receive salvation. Going to my story, brothers and sisters, I was born into a Christian family in Romania. And um, we never met Muslims. <coughs> I've never seen Muslims in my whole life at the beginning. And not just that, but at school we were taught that Muslims are very bad people. And subhanAllah, that's the same thing that's being taught in media today. I was just uh, with some brothers in the morning and they showed me some research of how the Australian media portrays Muslims, you know. And they've really made some amazing you know, statistics. And that's the reality, right? Now you think of the, your average Aussie picking up the newspaper, he walks by the masjid every day, he looks at the mosque and he's like, he runs, you know, what, as what, cause of, because of what he's seen in the newspaper. I was in the same position. In school they used to teach us that the Muslims are, you know, pagan, they are evil, barbarians, and so on. And it used to be part and parcel of the curriculum that we used to learn. So imagine what kind of thoughts I had about Islam. I mean, I could never ever imagine that one day I'll be sitting here speaking to you about Islam. Never. This is the last thing in my mind that I'm going to be a Muslim. Because I don't like them. They're pagan. No, we are in the right path and we are the army of God and we are the good people. And the Muslims are the devils and they're worshipping a moon and, you know, idols and this and that. And they're Turks. You know, that's all. I didn't, I didn't know there's uh, Muslims outside of Turkish, you know, the, the Turkish community. Because that's all we knew. I mean, that's what Romania had tangents with, with Turkey and the history of the Ottoman Empire and how they took over and we poor Romanians, you know, we we're oppressed and you know, the whole story, right? And growing up with that, it came that SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me to move to Canada and begin my studies there in high school. And that's the first time I met a Muslim and he was white, <laughs> which was surprising to him, like, what's going on? What happened to you? And he had blue eyes. So I said, you're not a Muslim, real Muslim. He's like, no, I'm Muslim, man. I'm like, trust me. He's like, I know what I am. And he's from Bosnia. And we start talking about Islam. And what happened is that what I learned about Islam before didn't match with what I saw. And here I want to make a very important remark. The behavior of the Muslim is so important. 
Because that's not the first thing I've heard that قال الله وقال رسول, which is very important. Subhanallah, it's very, very important, no doubt. But you know, someone doesn't want to listen to you if you're being a, a bad person or have bad manners. They don't even want to deal with you. So I saw good people around me in my high school, boys causing trouble, hustling, bustling, or whatever. But they're good people. They didn't, you know, lie and cheat. And when I needed them, they were there for me. And I realized that what I was taught didn't match what I saw. So that, again, goes to show that behavior is so important. It's not the only thing that we do da'wah with, because it's not enough to just be a good person. You should also invite people and speak to them. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Convey from me even if it's one ayah. But the Prophet ﷺ showed us his behavior. The Prophet ﷺ, I'm not speaking for myself, I'm not some kind of, you know, uh, free thinker who's just saying let's all be nice and good and hold hands and be, you know, model role citizen. We should be. <coughs> but the Prophet ﷺ had the best manners and character. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ عَظِيم, the word عظيم is used for the Qur'an. Allah SWT describes the Qur'an as عظيم. But He also describes the khuluq or the, the behavior of the Prophet ﷺ as عظيم. And the Prophet ﷺ himself says, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was sent, indeed I was sent, to perfect manners. And we, I mean, I can go on. You've all know, I'm, I'm sure I'm repeating myself and you all heard of this. But then it goes back to the point of how do we behave normal? It should be natural. How do we behave with our brothers? How do we behave in our community? How do we behave with our neighbors? Because that opens the door for discussion. Because that's exactly what it did for me. And for many new Muslims that I've surveyed, and I've been working with new Muslims for the past 15 years. Since I became Muslim, the next month that I became Muslim, I started working with new Muslims. And they all say the same thing. They didn't just become Muslim from just like that. There was something that opened the doors for a discussion, for questions, for them to come closer to Islam. It took time. For me, it took about five years. But, it, but people were open. So at that time, imagine, I'm 14 years old. I want to go party and club and this and that. But there's something about this guy. This man, my friend, there's something different about him. I go to his house, his house is spotless, clean. And I asked him like, well, what's going on? Why is your house so clean? Like, who, do you, who cleans your house, you know? I'm, I'm pretty clean, but I've never seen anything like this. And he says, well, this is part of Islam. At-tahara shatrul iman. For everything I'm gonna say, I'm gonna try to give some, some delil from the, from the Quran and Sunnah. So I was like, wow, you know, that's amazing. It's really amazing. We used to go out, he used to be on time, mashallah, something that, you know, we the Muslims need to, I don't know how it is in Sydney, but back home, man, being on time is like, whew, half an hour, depends which time. Uh, but he was on time. And he was a good brother, a good friend to me. And subhanAllah, even though I kind of corrupted him and took him in places that I shouldn't have taken him, there was something about him. Whenever we were, even we were clubbing, when Salah time came, he would pray. In the club, yeah, he would go to the corner in the club and pray. SubhanAllah. I mean, maybe we, we couldn't, we'd not necessarily agree with that. But at, he was a boy and he would pray. We would go to the gym, anywhere outside. When time for prayer would come, he would pray. So we were in the, kind of the club one time. So, you know, prayer time came and whatnot. I'm not going to say his name because maybe he's going to see the video. I'm like, why are you talking like that about me? But we were in the club. And Salat came and he prayed and then he came back and started dancing and the whole, you know, nine yards. And um, when we're walking home, it just came to me. I was like, bro, I want to ask you something. I said, it's kind of like a contradiction, isn't it? That we're like dancing with girls and then you go on to pray and then you come back to dancing with girls. And he's like, I know. He's like, you're right. I was like, really? He said, I know what I'm doing is wrong. But see, this... I'm going to keep this door open to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make tawbah, repentance. Because I know I'm wrong. So prayer is a door to God that I'm never going to close. I'm going to keep, you know. And I know one day I'll walk through it and that's it. I'm going to close it. I'm not going to go back to what I am. And I was like, oh, that, that makes sense. So we had a deal. 
between us. I said, you teach me more about your prayer and I'll take you to more clubs. <laughs> he said, deal, okay, good. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding, I mean, that was the deal. And um, one time we're in Toronto, in Canada, it was uh, just before Fajr time, we went to buy a car and we were out the whole night and uh, we parked somewhere and it was Fajr time. So he um, prayed as usual. So I was looking at him praying and when he made sujood, something hit me very hard. And I remember at that time I was Christian still, Jesus peace be upon him going in the garden of Gethsemane and falling on his face and praying. I mean, I've learned this from so many times, I've, but I've never made that connection. And that's where it goes to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He opens your heart and He opens your mind, things might be in front of you your whole life, but you might not see them. The signs are there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, <laughs> The ayats are there. No doubt about it. The signs are there, but we don't see them. So I looked at him, making sujood, and I say, Jesus does that, or he did that. I don't do that. Most Christians don't do that. If not all, there's one sect of Christians who still pray by doing sujood. I believe somewhere in Syria. And that's it. And I'm like, why? Then the next thing came to mind. When I walk in the church and I kiss the pictures, I kiss a Jesus who has a beard and a Mary who has a hijab. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on there? I'm like, that's weird, because none of the Christians really have that, except you know, the priests and Orthodox priests in Europe and the nuns. But the regular people don't. So I don't know, I was just very, very disturbed by that. But it was that time where my heart started opening and academically questioning my own faith which ultimately made me leave it. Why? Because what the church was teaching, what the Bible was teaching, and what I saw the Muslims practicing didn't match. So what the church is teaching is not what the Bible is teaching. What the Bible is teaching in many cases is very close to what the Muslims are doing. So I was like very confused. So I did a very thorough study of Christianity. I'm not talking about just your, you know, I don't like the Trinity and that's it. No, no. And I left Christianity. I didn't become Muslim right away. I just left Christianity. And I started taking different religion courses, reading many books. Amongst them, of course, Islam. And because our culture, even though our family was not the practicing, except my grandma, it was a bit embarrassing to show that I'm studying Islam. You could study whatever you want, subhanAllah. People these days, you know, if you want to study about uh, uh, weird, any weird religion, they will be like, oh, that's cool. That's a very academic endeavor and a very, you know, beautiful thing you're doing. You're trying to expand your, your information. But as soon as you take something about Islam, you're like, oh, what's going on here? Are you sure you want to do that? You're going to get burnt. So I used to hide books under my pillow at night and then at night wake up and read. And then at school, I used to tell my friends, they're going out for lunch and whatever. I'm like, no, I got to do something by myself. So I used to go to the library and read books about Islam. Whatever I could get my hands on. I didn't even know. It was a lot of weird stuff, of course, that you would find in Canadian libraries. Nonetheless, I was reading through them and going and learning and asking questions and talking to people. And, you know, again, with my friend, having a lot of discussions. And uh, one day I went to the masjid. You know, with my friend, it was Ramadan, we prayed Tarawiyah, and it was a very long prayer. <laughs> and I said, bro, that's a very long prayer. I'm like, do you guys do that on a regular basis? He's like, no, it's just Ramadan, you know? And I was very tired. But SubhanAllah, an old a friend of mine saw me. It was, uh, I think most of you guys, a lot of Lebanese here, right? He was a Lebanese guy. He's a really big, mashallah, Muslim guy. We had some past, we knew each other, kind of. So he saw me and he's like, Gabriel, is that you? I'm like, yeah. I was sitting with some brothers in the back talking. They were talking to me, give me down, you know? So he came to me and said, are you Muslim? I said, yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> like it was a slip of a tongue, you know? 
So he didn't hear the no, he just heard the yeah. And because he was a very loud guy, he starts screaming in front of him. He became Muslim. Allah Akbar. I know this guy. Oh my God, you don't understand. So I was like, no, no, no. And even my friends like, no, 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 not Muslim yet. <laughs> but subhanAllah, in my heart, I wanted it. Not because it's just attractive or whatever, but I was studying it. It was making sense. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was opening my heart and my mind. But I was fighting it. And this is where most of the people are who are interested in Islam. I'm sure a lot of people might have come through this masjid, might have, you might have met friends, colleagues that you work with, and they're like, you know what, Islam is really nice, it's really good. It's just, if, it, there will be, if I really believe in religion, Islam would be the one that I would choose, right? But, like the whole commitment and rules and regulations is very difficult, you know, I can't. That's because inside of them, there's a, there's a, there's a war. There's a spiritual war. They know it's right. And the fitra of human beings are such that they need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, even psychologists uh, recently they discovered in the brain the God spot. You know, they call it the God spot. You can do some research on it. But human beings are wired for faith. And if they don't take faith in, they're going to look for a substitute. So a lot of people today are in spirituality, yoga, in, uh, Buddhism and so on, right? Because they want to fill that void with something, right? They, they just can't. It's, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's like a, a, a fish swimming, you know, I mean, not swimming in, in the water, you know, being outside of water if you don't have God. And human beings need to, to understand that, yeah, of course, Islam has rules and regulations, but human beings need rules and regulations. Leave this masjid right now, and you're going to have to drive on the left side, right? And you have to stop at the sign, stop sign, and you cannot go past a certain speed limit, and you have to pass in, you know, green or yellow, you cannot pass on red. There's rules for every single turn you take, and that's just for driving. What about everything else? Everything has rules, man. Everything. So when these people talk about this, oh, I don't know, organized religion, it's too many rules. It's the other part inside of them telling them, don't go, don't go, stay. Yeah, it makes sense. I know it's the right way, but you're gonna, you know, how can, are you really willing to commit? Are you really willing to, you know? Another thing that we hear from people is that they say, there's too many things that are not allowed to be done, right? So I think we had a lecture the other day, we were counting. We only, we're ab only able to count about seven things that are like really haram, you know, in this life. Right? Riba, alcohol, zina, uh, cheating, stealing. I mean, what else? You know, there's very few things that are really, really, you can say are, you know, clear cut, 100%, you know, you can say are, you're not allowed to do. And by default, everything else is halal. Right? So, it's, people think that there's a billion things that, no, everything's no, 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 no. That's not true. For those who study fiqh and usul al-fiqh and understand the, the qawaid and the rules, you find that, subhanAllah, Islam is so vast. I mean, it's just amazing. So human beings need Islam. But the internal fight, people are saying no, no. So I was saying to myself, no. My mind was saying yes. My heart was saying yes. My tongue slipped and said yes. But I was fighting and saying no, no, no. Because no, why? Well, because, you know, girls and girlfriends and I don't know partying and all these the shahawat and desires that are hooking you and people think that khalas if I'm gonna become Muslim I'm not gonna have girls anymore you know or I'm not gonna have desires no you will but they'll be channeled in a halal way so there was that internal talk with me one night I came from a party I was a little bit under the influence of, uh, of alcohol and um, I went to sleep and I had this amazing dream. I had a dream. <laughs> I'm not using that as a proof for Islam but it was a wake-up call and in that dream I was in a party and this girl came and stabbed me with a knife and it was in psychology we call it a vivid dream. It's a very real dream. You cannot tell the difference between reality and dream. And I woke up and it was, well actually I didn't wake up yet. When I get stopped, I got, I went outside in the backyard and I saw a light in the heaven and my soul lifted towards it. 
So I woke up and I was crying and I was all sweaty. And I thought, you know, something happened. It's a sign from God or whatever, you know. I went and checked on my family. Are they okay? Everything was fine. But I, I, I started slowing things down in life and thinking a lot about that. Because I said, what if I die tomorrow? What if I'm not going to live? I'm very young. Things are going well. But what if I'm going to die tomorrow? Am I really ready to face God by saying that I knew what's the right way, but I, don't, I didn't want to take it? I went to university, first year university. Started university, and again, excuse after excuse. No and no and no to Islam, no, no, no. Till one day, I saw a little video. And then, let's make another sign out here. You know, don't underestimate the smallest da'wah effort. It was just a very little video about death. It was an Islamic video. It was on YouTube, I think YouTube appeared, or some kind of platform, I don't understand. I don't remember. But it was a very short video about death. And it hit me so hard, again, to the point that I called my friend and I said, look man, I want to come to the masjid more because I was kind of running away from it now. I want to come to the masjid. So I started going to the masjid again, reading more. One day I woke up. It was just a regular day, uh, fall, autumn day in Canada. And I woke up and I had it in me. I was like, you know what, this is the day. Alhamdulillah, I took shahada. And uh, when my friend gave me shahada, he's like, do you remember that long taraweeh prayer that we prayed together? He said, Wallahi, I made so much dua for you in sujood. That, oh Allah, if this guy is sincere and is looking for you, please guide him. Give him Islam. And you're talking about years between that and that. But that, again, a side note here, it goes to show that, see, dua is so powerful. And we need to make dua for people. Do we make dua for our parents, for our children, for our wives, for our fathers, for... Do we make dua for our neighbors who are not Muslim? Oh Allah, guide them. Oh Allah, if there's anything good in their hearts, guide them, Ya Allah. Like, and I'm not saying just, you know, Allahumma adiyum, you know, just like that. Well, it's very natural for us to say I'm talking about sincere dua from the bottom of our hearts in sujood for Allah to guide them. So, subhanAllah, uh, I thought that this is it. You know, it was such a long journey, five years. I've lost a lot. I was very popular in high school. I had, you know, so many things going for me, playing soccer. I think you guys call it soccer, right? It was very popular, you know, going out. Everything was going, it was what, you know, the, the, the teenager's dream. And I left that. I left all of that. And I thought that this is it, you know, I reached Islam. Khalas, this is it, I'm gonna have, you know, a good life. And SubhanAllah, as soon as I entered Islam, this is when the test started. This is when life got real difficult. And this is where we need to understand, all of us, new Muslims, and also, I'm sure a lot of you didn't practice, you weren't born with just like practicing Islam. You're two, three years old, and you're making salah, four, five, six, seven, mashallah, everything is perfect, you're praying qiyam, fasting. No. At some point in our lives, 20, 19, some of us 40, some of us later, you've decided to really get serious about Islam, you know right? And then you've noticed a lot of times that that's when the challenges came. And sometimes from the people that are closest to you, from your family and your friends and so on. Because that's the thing, and I'm, now let me go back to new Muslims, that's the thing. When new Muslims, when people embrace Islam, the shaitan is very, very unhappy. He's going to come after them. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test that person to see if they're really truthful or not. Because it's not enough to just say, La ilaha illallah. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Kabut, Alif Lamim, Hasib al Nas, Ayutraku, Ayakulu Amanna, Fahum Laif Tanun. Do people think it will be enough to just say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and not be tested? Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested the one before them. So that Allah will show who is truthful and who is a liar. Many people have embraced Islam in the past. The Munafiqeen of Medina, they embraced Islam, they had a benefit. And trust me, the nifaq continued throughout the history of Islam. People embraced Islam for many, many different reasons. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always showed why they embraced Islam. 
And I'm going to be very honest, I'm a revert. But if you study Islamic history, most of the sects or the problems in Islam started from reverts, from people who have embraced Islam. Because they didn't have the Arabic, they didn't, I mean, they're coming from all kinds of backgrounds. Many, many, I'm not going to start talking about who and what, but many, many problems in Islam started from people who embraced Islam. So, because Allah tests you, Allah will show you, Allah will expose you. And this is where we come in as a community. If we don't get serious about new Muslims, guess what? They're either going to leave Islam or they're going to be just another body in the community taking up space, sorry to say that. Demanding things, coming to the masjid, help me. Somehow we feel that if we're new Muslims, we should just come to the, to the Arab community, to the Muslim community and say, help me, I need money. I'm sure you get that sometimes. I don't know, maybe if you don't, alhamdulillah. But I see it so much that sometimes people come that I need this, I need that. And some do really need it. But there has to be a system of how to help them and what to do. And we need to get serious about it. And that's why the Prophet if we go back to the Dalil, the Prophet established that ukhuwa, that brotherhood between the Muhajirin and the Ansar. The Muhajirin are coming with a need. The Ansar are new Muslims. But subhanAllah, look at the support system that was created. You know? Look at the support. Iman entered their hearts, they were sincere, and they were helping each other. This is something that we don't even sometimes know this concept of ithar. Ithar means to prefer your brother over yourself. But are we ready to do that? Most of the new Muslim programs that I've worked with or I've seen all over the world, be it the UK, uh, US, Canada. Uh, I'm trying to still understand what you guys are doing here. Um, in, in the Middle East, most of the support uh, new Muslim programs are failures. People come, take Shahada, you take their number, you give them a certificate of reversion to Islam, and then they're out. Sometimes you don't see them. And that's not enough. It's not enough to just take shahada. It's not enough to just give, to say takbir. It's not enough to just give us statistics. And, you know, where we, where we come from, we have a, a monthly statistics that we give out and we submit and we say, this month, 330 people became Muslim. And they do. About 300 people became Muslim in our center monthly. In Ramadan, we had 600 people embracing Islam. Out of that 600, I can guarantee you that we're only going to see about 5 or 10. I can guarantee you, if, what about the other ones, where are they? Well, they're around and about. What are they doing? I don't know. I have no clue what they're doing. Because we don't have a proper system of follow. Well, how come? We have so many numbers. We, there's so many people. Sadly to say, Mithra Zabad al we are like the foam on the top of the sea. A lot. Yet it's not settling, it's not doing anything. Sadly, I'm putting myself there before I put you. And talk, let's not even talk about it, what kind of support system we have back there. We have funding and this and that. And still, people are not serious about it. To have a real, strong, new Muslim support system is not just enough to have funding. You need people with hearts. You need people who care and love. You know, these new Muslims, they need love. I'm telling you, they need support. That's what they need. When I embraced Islam, everyone was against me. I was going at the time at a Catholic high school, even though I was not Christian anymore. But I was going to Catholic high school. My friends found out. They wouldn't care that I'm not Christian. But when they found out I became Muslim, oh boy, that's when it started. So I could choose anything. I could be anything. I could be a thief. I can be screwing around, messing around. It doesn't matter. They're cool with it. But as long as I, when I became Muslim, oh man, all the books and the uh, proofs and the, all the you know, attacks and the, all these things came. Islam is like this and Prophet Muhammad is like that and da da da. SubhanAllah. And I don't know anything. All I know is La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Whatever I've read in books, but my aqidah is not yet firm. I'm not re ready, you know, I'm not really into it. So it was a very, very difficult time. But I had some brothers from Lebanon, from Egypt, from Pakistan, you know, they were living with me. They took me in. They're not the most knowledgeable people, but subhanAllah, they loved me. 
they made Isa, whatever I needed. I remember, you know, I broke up with my girlfriend. They took me in. They didn't let me sleep alone. They said, you're going to come and stay in our house. And they fed me. And we cooked together. And we traveled together. And we shared clothes. And they took me to the masjid. We played football together. They're always there for me. They're like my family. So I didn't feel like I lost so much, even though I lost all my friends. And the fitna was there, and people were coming, and you know, people from the past, and, but they were always there for me. They never left me alone. Because when you're alone, as the Prophet said, the lone sheep, shaitan will be on them. So that support system, I felt personally, was the best thing that ever happened to me. And that's what I think we need to do. When we see a new Muslim, I'm not saying here just like be, you know, uh, foolish and just give out everything. No. But to have a system where people open up their hearts, open up their houses, open up whatever they can, uh, help them to be educated. Help them not to be educated on Islam. That's a big mistake that new Muslims do. They, mashallah, they love Islam, they start learning Islam, and they quit university, they quit college, they don't want to do anything, they say everything is haram. Bro, guess what? Guess where you live in? You're not living in Mecca. Okay? And even there. So, I'm not here giving fatwas, but you got to be careful. And look at the way that the Sahaba made the transition in their faith. Look at the way they did things. Yes, they cut down the haram. I'm not saying that. But, are you going to quit your education? Are you going to just, you know, leave everything? No. Allah is saying, take that dunya that you have and search with it the akhirah. Don't forget your part of the dunya. Allah didn't ask us to be monks. You live with the people. We all go and we live in societies where yes, there's things that are not good. But we need to be careful and separate those. So a lot of new Muslims, they leave studies and we need to help them and teach okay maybe you're in a haram place okay how about we offer here some courses to help you continue your education so you're not always going to take things from the masjid you're going to end up in a position where you're going to be giving them to the masjid because the masjid gave you at some time invested in you and now you've developed yourself and now you're giving back so imagine uh, Bob or whatever his name is, he becomes Abdullah and after five years the masjid invested in him, he took a degree, he's working now, he's coming back to the masjid and he's giving back to the masjid to new Muslims who just embrace Islam right now. So it's a system that's sustainable, it keeps working and we're investing in them. But we need to do that. Marriage, a lot of them are coming from a background where you know they had women and you know whatever or the, the sisters had men and they want to get married. I'm not saying the first day, subhanAllah, I've seen it many times, sister takes shahada, and then the brothers are lined up outside to propose, you know, I'm not even kidding you. Like, it's like day one, and they're like, what? what? It's happening. And to the brothers too, subhanAllah, the brother takes shahada, the mothers are outside proposing, because they want a white guy or whatever, you know, a revert or something like that, it's like their dream, you know, I don't know. Back in that side of the world, it's the dream to have a, you know, um, a western revert in the family. And for some it's not. Other Western reverts will find it very difficult to get married because the families and the communities will be like, oh, we don't trust you, you're a revert. Who knows what you've done before? Well, guess what? The Sahaba were reverts. And what they've done before Islam, it's documented even. We know exactly what they used to do before Islam. And they used to talk about it. Uh, are you better than Sahabas? Or am I better than Sahabas? No way. So, but marriage was very easy. Why is it so difficult these days, man? People like just lock their doors. They'll never give their daughters. They'll never give their sons. But guess what? These people have embraced Islam. They need help. They need support. They, we need to open our hearts. We need to open our houses to them. I know it's not easy. I know there's cultural barriers and so on and so forth. But still, let us not be that strict when it comes to it. We can pick. We can select. We can look around. But we need to have options for them. But again, I go back to it needs to be a system. It needs to be organized in such a way where the new Muslim receives support for the beginning period and then he or she transforms into a member of our society. With knowledge of Islam, which is the most important, they have to have knowledge of Islam. With 
knowledge of the world so they can work and support themselves and family and so on and they contribute to the masjid and the community and the community will grow and they'll keep feeding back into the same place where they started from and new people keep coming in and you invest again and they become good and stable and they invest back into the community and you find that the community will grow and grow and grow last but not least the knowledge of Islam the most important you need to teach new Muslims and I'm not talking about only how to pray and you need to make that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot of them are coming from very so-called spiritual backgrounds and when they embrace Islam they don't understand Arab yet they don't understand Quran yet so uh, that first six months sometimes it's a a uh, period that's devoid of spirituality for them and it's very dangerous because they were used to saying oh God and you know kneeling down before going to sleep and they say right they say I talk to God and God talks to me and I've heard that a lot but they're used to that and then we tell them no you got to move like this and move like that so it becomes very like mechanic for them right they're not the Sahaba who understood the Arabi and they you know the Quran even before they were Muslims used to impact their hearts we know the story of Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahal, you know, listening to the Quran and what impact it had on them, even though they didn't become Muslim, uh, become Muslim. But these ones, these people, they don't understand. So you need to figure out a way to make sure that they experience spirituality, that they have the skia of the nafs and the, in that period. So teach them how to make dua. Teach them what dua means and how to make dua and when to make dua and how important dua is. Teaching, teach them the, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, the, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik, what all these mean and how and how important are in their lives. So they can feel, they can grow in love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important, the heart. You have to work on the heart. Don't just work on the body. It's not just a movement. Teach them about sujood. What did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say about sujood? This is the closest place to Allah subhanahu wa taala in a way that befits him. Ask Allah, make du'a. Let them open their hearts. Let them cry. Give them something inspirational. Love them. Do ithar so they can feel that subhanallah. This brother has preferred me over him. Like they will open. They will change. I've never ever in my life met more acceptance and love and good manners than what I've seen from the Muslims. I know these days a lot of people are saying the Muslims are this and even us we say that we're not educated, we're not, we don't have manners, we're not uh, you know um, disciplined but wallahi amongst us there's so much khair and I've met some brothers even living with the Arabs in the in the Middle East you know I've never seen people who are more hospitable and have more adab I'm talking about real adab, you know, when they say salams to you, they shake your hand properly, they look in your face, they're smiling. I mean, it's just amazing. I've learned these things from them and I cherish these things. I never found these things in my country or in Canada, even though people are very nice. They're polite, you know, hey, Bob, hey, Stacy, how are you? Good morning. But so you feel it that it's not really genuine, you know, they're nice. It's just part of the culture. But subhanAllah, the Muslim. When he says, Salaamu Alaikum, Kif Haaluk, Allah Hayyik, you know, he's making dua for you. SubhanAllah, Barakallahu Feek. He's making dua for you. He's giving you the right away. He's doing something for you. Small things, man, but it really touches your heart. So we need to work on that. Teaching them and practicing it ourselves because it's going to open the heart. That's what we need. At that stage, we need to work on the heart. Teach them how to pray, of course. Teach them Quran. Teach them how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and what it means. And teach them Aqeedah. Teach them faith, Iman. They need to know who is Allah. How can they love Allah if they don't know who Allah is? And when they know Aqeedah, this is the most important thing. I'm sorry, don't go into issue number 625 down the line as to whether we should pray 8 rakahs or 20 rakahs in Tarawih. Okay, this has been debated by the scholars hundreds of years ago. It's established, you know, but teach them who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah tells us, Allahu la ilaha illa wal hayyul qayyum, la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la nawm, explain to them what does that mean. Who Allahu la ilaha illa hu, 
الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المحيمن الله أكبر تيجي دم ذيز آيات تيجي دم ذيز صفات أو الله سبحانه وتعالى correctly you'll find their hearts loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach them that Allah is al-wadud he is the most loving he has divine love for his creation and that's why the worst criminal when he repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah accepts them teach them to have hope بين الخوف ورجاء to be between fear and hope because that gives them motivation you know they're coming from Allah knows what kind of sins and they might feel like I'm, I'm never going to be forgiven do I have hope? teach them these stories so they feel that no you have hope and Allah is forgiving your sins and Allah loves you Allah has chosen you to be a Muslim because that will really really more and I'm not saying we're just lying to them so this is what the Prophet ﷺ taught this is what Allah is telling us we're giving the dalil here we're not just making up we're not just oh my god let's be all nice and you know positive and whatnot you know everything is positive no Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Right away, He says Malik Yawm al Don't be fooled that He's Rahman Ar-Rahim. He's also the Master of the Day of Judgment. He's going to judge you. But there's a balance between fear and hope. And you need to know how much dosage you give and when. And this is hikmah. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ practiced. Yes, there was indhar, there was warning, but there was also bushra, there was also glad tidings. So we, my argument, and I close with this, is that for us to have a proper new Muslim program, support program, it needs every single one of you here and your families and whoever is not here to get involved in whatever way, to be systemized, to be organized, to be led by someone, to be put as a strategic plan, that's very, very much needed. And number two, we have to be very, very loving. We have to be very, very accommodating. We have to be very, very, you know, open to bring these people and to save them. And as one of our teachers used to say, the da'wah is like a hospital. You check in people, you treat them, and then you check them out. It's not like a hotel where people just check in and check out whenever they feel like. It's like a hospital. You treat people. People come in sick. You're heart doctors. You help them to become better. So they themselves can get out there in the society and contribute to this ummah. But don't make it be like a hotel where people just check in, check out whenever you want, room service, this and that. No, no, that's not how, what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that. We have to be strict. We have to have rules and regulations. But at the same time, we have to understand who are we dealing with and that these people need treatment. And by Allah, the people are looking for Islam. I'm telling you, they're not happy wherever country, whatever country I've been to, people are looking for Allah. They just don't know that Islam is the one that offers it. And it's up to us. It's up to us to do these things. So may Allah bless you. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, I hope I didn't go too long. If there are any questions, we can address some quick questions. And if not, may Allah subhanahu wa bless you and your families and your community. And Jazakumullah khair. Some dreams to be up in Jenna, 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 Jenna. It pies person's destiny. Shall I in Jenna, 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 Jenna?